Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, this is especially appropriate to brief here on the Hornet because Hornet was the prime recovery ship for Apollo 12, as it was for Apollo 11. So that's why it's really relevant to talk about the uh, 54th anniversary of the splashdown of Apollo uh, 12. Um, I talk about opening lunar exploration, and um, this really is the case with Apollo 12 because Apollo 11 was a developmental mission. It wasn't meant to be an operational mission per se because there's two things that were done in Apollo 11 which were never done before. And that's the uh, power descent to uh, the uh, landing area and then the pitch over to prepare for the actual touchdown. That was never done before. And I'm gonna go over all the different things that were done by previous Apollo missions to pave the way for Apollo 11. But when you got to Apollo 11, they still had white knuckles when it came to getting onto the lunar surface. These guys did everything that's been done before. So this was an operational mission. All they had to do was get the bird on the ground and then do the mission that they were given. So that's why this was especially uh, important. And as you know, we landed on the moon six times, number 12, number 14, and then 15, 16, 17. Uh, those were the uh, missions, actually 12, let's see, 13, 4, 15, 15, 16, 17 actually carried a cart to the lunar surface. And those three missions traveled a total 59 miles on the lunar surface collecting rock samples. And, you know, to think that here we are driving 59 miles on the lunar surface, it's just incredible. But we were up on the moon for six times. Okay, so the outline of the briefing, I'm gonna go over some of the hardware overviews so you know what we're talking about in terms of the Saturn V and the command and service module. So this is basically a little bit of a technical uh, diversion. But then I'm going to get into the Apollo 12 mission, the overview and the launch. The launch, um, we're going to actually have three videos. Uh, the launch of a Saturn V, which was Saturn Apollo 4 with enhanced sound. So it's really going to be cool. Then we're going to show the launch of Apollo 12, which had some surprises in it. And then I'm going to show you the actual lunar landing, the view out the cockpit window of the lunar module to see what the astronauts were actually looking at when they were approaching the lunar surface. And then after they landed on the moon, of course, what they had to do is get back. And we're going to talk about Luna, the Apollo 12 reentry. And how did they do the reentry? You're coming back at 25,000 miles an hour, which at 400,000 feet is Mach 34, if you do the calculation. And then how do you get down from going from 25,000 miles an hour to hitting the water at 20 miles an hour? Pretty, pretty nifty uh, technology was used. Then we're going to talk about the uh, uh, re recovery and decontamination, and then some final thoughts. This is totally amazing to me. This is the Saturn V, which got us to the moon. And I broke this down into main engines, and then uh, thrusters, and then solid rocket motors. And if you look at this, you'll see that we have a total of uh, 89 engines, solid motors, and thrusters. So you start with the main engines. At the bottom, you have the F1 engine. Each one generates 1.5 million pounds of thrust. Each engine burns three tons of propellant a second. And there's five of those engines, so that's a total of 15 tons of propellant going through those engines every second to lift this bird off the pad, and this was weighing 6.2 million pounds at liftoff. Then you go to the second stage here, and this has uh, J2 engines, which, which burn liquid um, oxygen and liquid hydrogen. Liquid oxygen is minus 297 degrees Fahrenheit. Liquid hydrogen is minus 423 degrees Fahrenheit. Very cold, but they're cryogenic. When you mix those together, they ignite spontaneously. We have one J2 here, then we get up into the command and service module when these are burning uh, aerosene 50 and nitrogen tetroxide for the operational mission. 
coming down on this side here, you're looking at all these thrusters on all the different components of the stack. And down at the bottom here, we have retro rockets. And these are solid rocket motors that fire after the first stage uh, burns out. First stage burns out, the stack stops accelerating. But you don't want that first stage to creep closer to the second stage. So in the fairings down at the bottom, right here, each fairing has two solid rocket motors pointing up. And those fire to slow that stage down and pull it away from the second stage. So the second, second stage can go on with the, with the mission. Now the second problem is you stopped accelerating. So when the stack stops accelerating, the propellant in the second stage here starts to slosh around very nicely inside the tank. So what you have to do is settle the propellants down to the bottom of the tank. And that's why there's, there's ullage rockets here, which are solid rocket motors, which fire downward, giving that second stage a little bit of acceleration to settle the propellants so they can get to the pumps to get to the engines. That's called an ullage uh, motor. Again, on this, we have uh, solid rocket retro rockets to pull it away from the third stage. And then the third stage has ullage mo motors also to settle the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen into the bottom of the tank so it's not sloshing around. So it's a combination of the, the big engines over here and then the solid rocket motors and a whole host of, of uh, thrusters to do attitude control. So you look at a total of 89 engines, solid motors and thrusters, and then to top off this whole thing, there are pyrotechnic devices on the Saturn V stack. You have linear shape, shape charges to separate the pedals of this section here. You have um, uh, pyro valves, a normally open pyro valve, a normally closed pyro valve. You have SEP nuts, you have explosive bolts, uh, that all have to fire on command to allow this stack to break apart into its stages and get propellants flowing to the engines and motors the way it should. A normally open pyro valve is typically closed. When you fire the pyro, it opens and it stays open. A normally closed valve, um, or normally, yeah, a normally closed valve is open, and then when you fire the pyro, it shuts it and it stays shut. But you need a pyrotechnic device, an explosive, to blow these valves open and closed. That's actually what's taking place here. And in this uh, shroud up here, there's a linear shaped charge that is a long piece of explosive uh, cord that when you detonate it, it blows those petals apart so it separates to expose the lunar module that's inside. But look at the complexity of just the booster, not to mention the mission planning and everything else that went into making this mission a success. So when you hear of the Saturn V, your eyes should water. It was an impressive machine. OK, let's take a look at something here. Why do all these motors look like bells? Okay, this is a uh, representation of an F1 engine. The, ex the diameter of this nozzle here is 12 feet. So two times me is the diameter across the bottom here. This generates 1.5 million pounds of thrust. So how does it work? I mean, I'm not gonna go into the gory details, but this thing over here is the turbo pump. This is what pumps fuel and oxidizer into the combustion chamber. The combustion chamber burns the propellants and it's generally a very high pressure inside the combustion chamber. And it's about 1,050 PSI inside the combustion chamber. The plate that's spraying the propellants together is three feet in diameter. That's the uh, injector plate and oxidizer and fuel, kerosene and liquid oxygen are being sprayed together inside the combustion chamber. It narrows to a throat, and then it goes into the expansion nozzle. So the big question is, the high temperature inside the combustion chamber, how do you keep this thing held together? 
there's 78 down tubes that the, f the fuel, when it's sprayed into the combustion chamber, first goes into a down tube. 78 down tubes um, until you get to a 3 to 1 area ratio relative to the throat. Then each of those tubes becomes two tubes. And that keeps the fuel going down up to this point here, which is a 10 to 1 expansion ratio. And then there's a manifold here that collects the fuel and sends it up tubes. And the fuel goes up the tubes, and then it's sprayed into the combustion chamber. So from here to here, you're being cooled by the fuel flowing through 386 tubes. And that is what keeps this at, a, at an operation, uh, operational temperature. This here takes the exhaust from the turbo pump. The turbo pump is running fuel rich, like 0.4 um, oxidizer to one fuel, very fuel rich. So it's very sooty. And this exhaust here is about 1,000 degrees. And then this exhaust is pumped into the rest of this expansion nozzle to cool this portion of the expansion nozzle. OK? So you're cooling using fuel. This is called regenerative cooling. And over here, you're cooling it using the exhaust from the turbo pump, which is very fuel rich. So it's very cool and sooty. And that, that's an important thing to keep in mind. So what happens, and the key thing here is coming up, here is your, your engine, here's your combustion chamber, here's your throat, and here's your expansion nozzle. You start pushing more and more propellants into the combustion chamber, the pressure goes up, the, the, the flow rate through the throat increases, increases more, increases more, until you reach Mach 1 at the throat. Then the engine is, is said to be choked because you cannot get any more fuel of mass flow rate through the nozzle because pressure waves can't get through the nozzle. The flow is coming at you at Mach 1. That's the way sound uh, travels. So if you want to get a signal into the combustion chamber, it's not going to make it. The flow is choked. You can't get more out of it. When the flow chokes at the throat, you enter a whole new realm of fluid dynamics called com compressible fluid flow. And that means when you ex increase the area in the expansion nozzle, look what happens over here. Mach number one here, the temperature and the pressure fall off as the area increases. But look what happens to the velocity. The velocity at the exit becomes very fast. But the pressure is coming down. And if you design your expansion nozzle correctly, the pressure of the gases coming out will equal the static pressure of the atmosphere outside the engine. So what you'll see, and I'll show you this, the flow is going to be coming right straight down out of that expansion nozzle. If you overexpand it, the flow will go into a cone and reduce an area. And if you um, underexpand it, when the flow comes out, it'll just burst right outside and, and be in a bigger area. So you don't want to overexpand it or underexpand it. You want the P, uh, the pressure here, to be equal to the static pressure P at sub S outside the nozzle. So that's why these um, engines all look like bells because they're all using the laws of compressible fluid dynamics to accelerate the gases to very high velocities outside the exit once you have choked flow at the throat. That's how it works. And that's why all of these engines look like bells. The J2 is a bell. Even the ones up here, if you look at the, the nozzle on the service module, it's a bell. Choke flow, very high velocity out the exit. OK? So that's how it works. So the Saturn V, this is the overall uh, dimensions, 363 feet tall. Uh, it weighs on the pad 6.2 million pounds. And that includes about 5.6 million pounds of kerosene and liquid oxygen. Um, First stage generates 7.5 million pounds of thrust. Now, the first 
time we flew the Saturn V was an unmanned flight, and that was Saturn Apollo 4. What they did here was very gutsy. They had tested the stages, and then they said, okay, we're going to test the rocket all up. Put all the stages together from the F1 engine all the way up to here. Let's put it all together and light it and see what it does. Okay? Now you're going to see what happened. Notice the flow? This is the turbo pump exhaust. And the flow is coming straight down. You can see it right there. This is ice coming off the uh, fuel and oxidizer tanks because it's so cold and Florida is so humid that ice forms. Here again, look at the turbo pump exhaust, and this is the chamber flow. And that is 15 tons of propellant a second being burned by those engines. And also, one thing you may have noticed, when it was lifting off the pad, you may have seen it go like a little bit this way. That's by design because they wanted to move the, the Saturn away from the tower in case one of those swing arms did not fold away properly. They didn't want the swing arm to cause a failure of the whole liftoff. So they deliberately pitched it over and then started to let it go up to avoid the swing arms. First one, Saturn Apollo 4, you just watched it. Complete success. And they also tested out the heat shield on the uh, command module. Uh, second flight was a near failure. Was Apollo 4 manned? No. Uh, 4 was unmanned. And then uh, six is the second flight, and that was also unmanned. But you know, she had two problems. The first stage developed a pogo um, instability, and the, the booster is going up, and then there's a very high frequency oscillation like this due to uh, variations in the propellant flow into the combustion chambers. That's called a pogo effect. You don't want that to happen, because that could be very destructive. Also, there was miswiring on the second stage. One engine was supposed to be shut down because it was having a problem. Two engines shut down. Didn't uh, please Werner von Braun one bit. So we had a near failure. Uh, Werner um, took a look at the, at the telemetry, figured out what happened, developed solutions. They put shock absorbers basically in the propellant lines to take into account these variations in pressure. And then a very, very gutsy call is right here. They went uh, to the third Saturn V launch, was Apollo 8, and they sent that to the moon with three astronauts. Talk about gutsy. I mean, it's incredible. We just had a problem with six, and then, okay, we want three guys to go on Apollo 8 flying the Saturn V. Amazing, and that was Borman, Lovell, and Anders. That was the first time people were inside the command module with this beast firing. 
And if you saw um, uh, some of the films or read uh, stories about it, Frank Borman inside the cockpit, everything was shaking like crazy because you're at the end of a stick that's 365 feet tall. And Frank, on his seat, has a lever. It's like a T lever. And if he rotated that 90 degrees, that would fire pulling the command module off away from the exploding booster. Frank didn't know if what he was experiencing was normal or was he at the last moments of his life. But rather than make a mistake and turn that abort handle, he took his hand off it and just wrote it out. Talk about gutsy call number two. That's what Frank did. He took his hand off the abort hang handle. He didn't want to jeopardize the mission. So that was Apollo 8, and Apollo 9 was um, another uh, test mission, and then we went to, um, this, this was actually a low Earth orbit test of the lunar module. 10 was a dress rehearsal that all went all the way to the moon, except it didn't do the power descent. And then 11 was actually manned and going to the moon, and you know all about that. And that's when they did those last two things, the power descent and actual landing for the first time. And that's why that was still a developmental mission. But you talk about guts. Here's gut number one. This is Apollo 8. And then you have a gutsy call here sending uh, Apollo 11 doing two things that were never done before, never tried, and it worked. So the spacecraft, uh, the command and service module. Uh, the command and service module, well, here is the command module. And this is the only part of this stack that's coming back. That little piece right there. Everything else is used and thrown away, basically. Only this comes back with its precious cargo of three astronauts. It is connected to a service module, which is this piece right here, that provides propulsion, telemetry, command, and life support to the three astronauts in the command module. And then you get into the lunar module, which is the descent, oh, I'm sorry, I'm zapping you, <laughs> reflection. Uh, it takes two astronauts to the surface, and then they return to the command module. And if you look at the command and service module here, and the lunar module is tucked away inside, right here inside this shroud. And if you look at the combined weight, it's roughly 97,000 pounds. But it takes all of this to get 97,000 pounds to the moon. That's the extent of the task at hand. So these are the things that we're going to be talking about, but the reentry was done by this piece right up here. And here's, here's the command module. Oh, man. Command module right there, and then the service module right there. Question? Yeah. Actually, well, to answer your question, stage one ends up in the Atlantic Ocean. Stage two uh, ends up burning up in the atmosphere. This is stage two right here. Uh, no, here, stage two. Stage three actually puts the command and service module and lunar module to escape velocity to get to the moon, 25,000 miles an hour. So it basically is moving at escape velocity relative to the Earth's gravitational field. So after the astronauts take the lunar module out of the third stage, it basically goes into orbit around the sun. It did not escape the gravitational field of the sun. It's still up there. Okay, So Atlantic Ocean burns up and um, orbit around the sun. And just for your information, we talked about stage one, two, and three. This black band right here is the brains of the booster. That's the instrumentation section that's got the, the sequencer, 
the telemetry, the communication of a telemetry to the ground. All the things you need to do to fly the booster is right in here, and I'm going to show you that in a little bit. But that's the brains. The instrumentation section is the, re the real heart of the booster. Okay, so what we have here, um, initially when President Kennedy said get to the moon by the end of the decade, NASA put together a plan, and the plan was to have the uh, man-carrying spacecraft land on the moon as one piece. And then the top piece of that would blast off and go back into lunar orbit and come back to Earth. And that's why when you look at this, this engine here is sized to blast off from the surface of the moon and get back to Earth. And that's why it's oversized. But when the NASA said, look it, there's a better way to do that, and that's called lunar orbit rendezvous and docking. Keep one astronaut orbiting the moon, but send two down in a smaller craft, and then have them come back up, go back into lunar orbit, and dock with the command module, and then everybody comes home in the command module. A lot more efficient, but you need to, or you need to be able to get into lunar orbit, and you need to be able to do a rendezvous and docking. Whoa. We never did that before, and that's why in the Gemini program we practiced rendezvous and docking in orbit to perfect the means to get to the moon, because that was so necessary. So that's what happened over here. The rendezvous and docking was adopted by NASA in June of 62, just about a year after President Kennedy said, get to the moon by the end of 1969. Now this is an interesting um, picture. This is the lunar module. It comes in two pieces. Um, this is the piece here that land gets the astronauts on the surface of the moon. And the key thing with this device is to keep it simple. You don't want to be on the surface of the moon with a complicated thing that's not going to work properly. So we have the, uh, the fuel is in the red tanks. The oxidizer, nitrogen tetroxide, is in the other tanks, and it's a simple blow-down system. The fuel and the oxidizer are hypergolic, so you don't need an igniter. When they spray together, they explode. Simple. And you just pressurize the tanks with helium, so you don't need a turbo pump. You just kind of open a valve let the stuff spray to each other, it explodes and it generates a lot of thrust out of this engine here that's throttleable. The astronaut can ease that back from 10,300 pounds to a lower value, about 6,000 pounds, and actually fly the lunar module to a landing point. When they're done with the mission, they are, let's see if I get this right, they're up here. That's the crew compartment right there, the two astronauts and they're going to fire the, the ascent engine, which is right there, and they're going to blast off using this as a launch pad and go back up into lunar orbit. With this, the two astronauts will be flying back to lunar orbit in this, and they will rendezvous and dock with the command module and then move the rocks and them back into the command module, and they're all going to come back home and they're going to basically discard the ascent stage and that will be uh, in lunar orbit eventually to crash into the moon. And they'll use that for seismic data recording because they've set up seismometers and everything so they'll learn a lot about the moon from the crashing of the ascent stage. <clears throat> but like I said, that vehicle is right in here and after they have gone to the surface it has completed its mission, and they get rid of it. Okay, let's look at the Apollo 12 mission, the overview, the launch, and the landing in the ocean of storms. Here's the crew. Look at all U.S. Navy, all captains in the U.S. Navy. And it's ironic, Apollo 11, the first moon landing, had um, one civilian and two Air Force people and they sent them to the Sea of Tranquility. If you want to go to the Ocean of Storms, you get the Navy guys involved. So we have three Navy guys, Pete Conrad, uh, Gordon, command module pilot, 
and Alan Bean also went down to the uh, surface. The liftoff was in 69. The landing was in November of 69. So this is the 54th anniversary of the splashdown of Apollo 12. Two EVAs, extravehicular activities. They spent on a total of seven hours, 45 minutes, walking around the surface of the moon, collecting samples. And both astronauts went out onto the lunar surface to do this exploration. OK, so let's take a look at the liftoff of Apollo 12. And a surprise will happen. Despite the overcast weather, the launch went well. The Saturn pierced the thick cloud cover. Then at 36 seconds into the flight, Mother Nature herself weighed in. Apollo 12 had been struck by lightning twice. The impact on the spacecraft was both instantaneous and catastrophic. You don't know what happened here. We had everything in the world drop out. I'm not sure if you were hit by lightning. Fuel cell lights and AC bus light, fuel cell disconnect, AC bus overload, one and two, main bus A and fade out. The command module telemetry was lost at mission control. All the screens went completely blanco. Um, they, the command and service module were on backup power. And the Saturn V just kept on chugging along. And that's what Warner Von Braun wanted to happen. Initially, they wanted the command module to command the Saturn V. And Warner said, nope, my bird's flying on its own. So while the lightning strike affected the command module, the big beast just kept on ch chugging along. OK, now, the interesting thing, it got hit again, the second strike. And then what happened was really interesting. There was a, a person on console called the ECOM, Electrical, Environmental, and Consumables Manager. He has his console, and he saw it went blank. And the, and the amazing thing is that he saw that same thing happen during an exercise. He said, I saw this happen before, and it was an exercise. And at that point in time, the whole point of the exercise was to have them learn how to set the signal control electronics to the aux position, which means it goes to a backup power to restore the telemetry so they can bring stuff back online. Now, the king of mission control is the flight director. He's called flight. Nothing goes to the, uh, to the Apollo capsule unless it goes through flight. ECOM would probably say in this environment, flight, this is ECOM, set SCE to AUX. And I think flight said, repeat, ECOM, said set SCE to AUX. Flight then said, Capcom, this is flight, inform Apollo to set SCE to AUX. The Capcom radioed up to the command module, set SCE to AUX, and all data returned to normal 100 per, uh, seconds after liftoff. Because the ECOM recognized the signature of the failure and knew exactly what to do to bring the bird back online. That's why these sadistic um, simulation guys are in the back room thinking of things to do to the people on the console to confuse them and make their lives diff difficult. But this is how it paid off. He knew exactly what to do by flipping a switch on the instrument panel, putting the SCE into the aux position. Bill, excuse me, but didn't yeah. the, the crew in the capsule, they weren't even too sure what the hell that was. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I think the Capcom told them where the SCE to aux switch is. It's in the, on the um, instrument panel on the lower right-hand side, and they went and flipped it and look it. Saturn continues ascent. That's what it looks like to burn 15 tons of propellant a second as it's rising through the atmosphere. Okay, the first thing you want to do if you're a Saturn V is get out of the atmosphere. It causes drag, it causes atmospheric heating. 
you just want to go straight up. But then what happens is over here, the brains that I told you about executes a pitch and roll program. So it rolls to the correct azimuth to be on the flight pass, and then it starts to pitch over. Because you want that velocity vector eventually to be parallel to the surface of the Earth, if you want to be in orbit. So the Saturn V is going up, roll program complete, it starts the pitch program, and this is completely dumb guidance, they call it, because all the booster is doing is following the program that's in the brain up there, okay? It's called dumb guidance. When you get to the second stage, this is called smart guidance because it says where am I and where do I need to go? And then it gimbals the engines to get to that point because it's going to be burning for six minutes. Burning, burning, burning. And finally, stage two burns out right here. And then you're still not at the right velocity. You should be going 17,500 miles an hour, and you're only going like uh, 16,000 something miles an hour. So you jettison stage two, retro rockets fire, ullage rockets fire, you light up stage three, and that burns for 45 seconds, and then you are in orbit at 120 nautical miles at 17,500 miles an hour. So you have successfully completed the first critical uh, event of the mission and that's getting to orbit. And then what happens, the next uh, events, um, this upper stage here after the astronauts check out the command module, service module, and the lunar module, everything, nothing got broken during ascent, they say we're good to go, and then mission control gives them the uh, very important uh, command, you are a go for TLI, translunar injection. And that is what the second stage will do again. It'll light up the second stage, it'll burn that again, and that will get the mission equipment going at the escape velocity necessary to get to the orbit of the moon, okay? Now, the thing is, <clears throat> when you're firing this upper stage, you may be firing it in this direction to go and uh, meet the lunar orbit out there at, at uh, the altitude of the moon. When you're burning in this direction, the moon is over here. Because when you're coasting for two and a half days out to the orbital altitude of the moon, the moon is in its orbit coming around at 2,000 miles an hour such that when you get to the altitude of the moon, lo and behold, the moon will be right there. And then you'll be captured by the gravity of the moon and you'll be in lunar orbit. So that's what they do for that, for that burn. <clears throat> so then when they get to the altitude of the moon and they confirm that it is in fact there, they fire the... Um, service propulsion engine, 20,000 pounds of thrust, and then uh, they separate when after they get into lunar orbit, they'll separate the command module from the lunar module, and they will, would do a landing on the lunar surface. Now, I'm going to show you a clip of what was going on in the cockpit of the lunar module, and that's right up in here. You can see these two windows right here. And what you're going to see are the astronauts, what they're looking at outside the window. You're going to hear um, some terms, P63, which is program 63, which is the burning of that uh, descent engine to get it to a lower altitude. Then you're going to hear P64. P64 is when... You're coming in like this with P63. P64 will pitch the lunar module over, and the astronauts, for the first time, will see the landing spot. How are they going to know what the landing spot is? You're also going to hear LPD, Pete. LPD is Landing Point Designator. In front of the um, uh, Pete Comrade is his window. It's got two panes of quartz glass. 
and engraved on each of the windows are lines marked with angles, 30, 40, 50, etc. Now, when Pete is standing in front of those two windows and he gets those two sets of lines to superimpose, then when, when uh, Bean calls out LPD 35, Pete, he looks at 35 and looking through that window at the alignment of those two sets of glasses, he can see where the landing site's going to be. That's the landing point designator. If he doesn't like what he sees, he goes to P66, program 66, which means he can take over manual control of the lunar module and move it around until he finds a nice place to land. So it's P63, P64, and then I think he, he does mention P66. So, and you're going to hear the spontaneity and the enthusiasm of these guys. So here is the landing of Apollo 12 on the surface of the moon. LPD 40. You heard that term, contact light. The the, from the bottom of the four foot pads on the lunar module is a rod that hangs down about six feet, I think it is. When it makes contact with the lunar surface, a signal goes back up into the cockpit saying that contact light, which means you've touched the surface of the moon, you're six feet off, you're there. So that's what that was all about. So they implemented a pinpoint landing technique, and uh, this was developed between 11 and 12, and they used the Doppler shift of the RF pattern to adjust the landing point. And um, Apollo 11 did not have this, but they wanted to have pinpoint landing because, like you see here, they wanted to land close to Surveyor 3. And there's the lunar module right there, and uh, they went and took pieces of it back but they had they got within 508 feet of surveyor 3 on this landing using this updated uh, pinpoint landing technique which was later used on all the landing uh, missions that uh, um, Apollo did. Uh, does everybody know what a Doppler shift is? Doppler shift for those who may not be familiar you're standing right next to a railroad track a train is coming towards you blowing its whistle and as it's coming towards you, it's compressing the sound waves. 
when it passes you, it's extending the sound waves, the, the wavelength. So instead of hearing a constant pitch, you're going to hear and that's what they were measuring using the RF signal from the lunar module. They can measure the Doppler and by doing that they can tell where it is relative to where it should be. Okay, two EVAs, two extravehicular activities, seven hours, 45 minutes, 75 pounds of rocks, and here you can see where they went in the area, just walking by the way, and um, then they went to Surveyor, which I think is over here, took a piece of it off, and went back to the, um, to the uh, lunar module. But seven hours, 45 minutes. Apollo 11 did one EVA for about two and a half hours. So we're extending our comfort zone here. Okay, after they got back into the lunar module, uh, they ignited the ascent stage, which is this little guy. And they took off from the descent stage and went back up into lunar orbit and did a rendezvous with the uh, orbiting CSM. And then after they had transferred the rocks and, you know, uh, astronauts and everything else and uh, camera film, they closed up the hatch, they uh, jettisoned the ascent stage, and they did a TEI burn, trans-Earth injection burn, to get them out of lunar orbit and get them on a path back to planet Earth. Okay, after they did some mid-course corrections along the way to Earth to make sure that they were coming back correctly, um, they did the re-entry. But there's more to this than meets the eye. They're coming back at 25,000 miles an hour. Um, and like I mentioned, that's Mach 34 at 400,000 feet, which is where reentry begins. That's really humming fast. So how are you going to take all of that energy and survive getting back to Earth? I'm going to show you how they did it. So <clears throat> the return trajectory, they corrected it to enter the reentry corridor, and I will show you what that is. Then they loaded the Apollo guidance computer, which is up in the command module, with this pad data to define the re-entry tra trajectory. And that was 27 parameters that they radioed up from mission control. And the astronauts copied that and entered it into the Apollo guidance computer. And then after they had that, uh, they separated the command module from the service module because the service module was not going to help them in reentry. And at that point, you are committed to doing reentry. There's only a limited amount of uh, life support, air, and oxygen, and whatnot in the command module. You can't stay in there for a long time. So if you don't successfully reenter, you're not going to survive. So they had to commit to reentry by loading the pad data and then um, uh, completing the, the, uh, the uh, reentry tra trajectory. Uh, then um, at 0.05 Gs, uh, when the inertial system senses 0.05 Gs, the Apollo guidance computer assumes command of the reentry hands off the, the astronauts, they're just sitting there for the ride. The guidance computer is flying the, the, uh, the machine. So what you're doing, you're traveling at, you know, 25,000 miles an hour, and you have to come into this little corridor right here. No shallower than 5.3 degrees and no steeper than 7.4 degrees. If you come in shallower than 5.3 degrees, you're going to skip off the atmosphere, you're not going to re-enter, and your lifespan will be limited by the life support uh, consumables on board the command module. If you come in steeper than 7.4 degrees, you will not survive re-entry because of the structural loads and the heating loads on the command module. So you have to come in right inside that white corridor, which is um, uh, shown there. And typically, uh, with the 
mid, uh, with the course corrections, the Apollo capsules came in right around six degrees off the horizon. So they did an excellent job of correcting the course. So that's the challenge, is to come into the reentry corridor. Okay, now if you have, this is an Apollo command module. If you had the center of mass right along the center of the, of the geometric axis, right there, right along the center line, you're going to experience one force, and that's drag, okay? So you're going in this direction, he's coming towards me, generating a lot of heat, and all you're experiencing is drag. But NASA had a better idea. They offset the center of gravity, and that forces more air to be deflected down here, thereby generating a lift force. And this is basically has become a lifting body. A measure of its efficiency is the L over D, lift over drag, and for this capsule, it's approximately 0 0.38. That's the aerodynamic efficiency of the Apollo capsule with about a one foot offset of its center of, of uh, gravity. Now, an airliner has an L over D of about 19. A sailplane, which is flying in thermals, you know, just with, with no engine, they have an L over D of, a, it could be as high as 40. So this is pretty close to a brick coming into the atmosphere. But now you've got a lift uh, force that you can play with. And what they did is use that. The Apollo guidance computer is going to use that lift. Okay, the astronauts' heads are down. The lift force is up by simply rolling the capsule, they change where that lift force is pushing the capsule. Thereby, they can target the splashdown point by using that lift force to move the capsule in its trajectory. Okay, so that was the way they controlled the landing of the capsule at the required splashdown point. So the, the capsule coming back, like I said, is astronauts hands off. They're just sitting there with their fingers crossed, and the Apollo guidance computer is rotating that lift vector where it needs to be to adjust the trajectory to come down to the splashdown point. Okay, now the problem is the heating. You're coming into the atmosphere very fast, and if you look at the temperature distribution, the stagnation point right here, it's 5,000 degrees. Moving along down here, 4,000, 3,000 over here, it's uh, 12 or 1,500. Along the top, it's 2,500 degrees. And that is the heat being generated by the capsule moving very fast through the atmosphere. If you look at <clears throat> a mercury capsule, remember, Alan Shepard went up in this little thing. The heat shield is right here. The rest of this is covered by metal uh, shingles, you might say, with the, the, that's a heat resistant um, um, metal. But the heat shield is ablative and it's right here. On the Apollo capsule, the entire capsule is covered by a heat shield. This is the blunt end here. You've got to have a heat shield here. This is the crew compartment, so you have to have a heat shield on this. And then there is another heat shield called the apex heat shield, which covers the Earth uh, landing system, the parachutes, the drogue chutes, uh, the, the uh, flotation uh, balloons, and things like that. So this is all covered with uh, stainless steel and then a heat shield. The whole thing is covered with a heat shield, not like Gemini and not like Mercury. Big difference. Okay, so how did they do that? It's in three sections. The forward heat shield, the apex, covers Earth landing. Crew compartment, and then the, uh, the blunt end has the main part of the heat shield. That's what's taking the brunt of the 5,000 degree temperatures of reentry. So you cover the entire command module with varying thicknesses. And the thickness of the shield at the base is 2.7 inches. 
and it gets thinner and thinner and thinner as you go up to the top to about 0.7 inches at the apex. And you're going to lose 300 pounds of the 1,500 pounds going through reentry because of the ablation process. You want it to ablate. It gets hot, it chars, it gives off a gas, the gas creates a layer right next to the heat shield. For a moment, it's protected from the high temperatures, and then you keep on charring and burning and outgassing until you get through the reentry process. So how do they do this? This is really interesting. These three pieces of the, of the command module come in uh, three pieces, stainless steel. They get it to the contractor's facility, and they attach um, fiberglass honeycomb. They bond the fiberglass honeycomb to the stainless steel. Then they cure that, and this honeycomb is exactly what you think. It's like a beehive with the honeycombs, little, little holes, 370,000 3H inch width holes are covering the command module. And it, then the task is to fill each of, each of those 370,000 holes with this um, epoxy phenol formaldehyde resin. You can't buy that in a local hardware store, believe me. But anyway, the, the people are called gunners. And you get about five gunners working on an area, and they have these little honeycombs. They stick a tool in each of the honeycombs, and it's, a, it's a, like a nozzle. And they pull the trigger, and it squirts that fiberglass resin into the honeycomb until they slowly pull it out, and it oozes over the top, and they wipe the top. Then they go over to the next hole, stick the thing in, pull the trigger, fill that hole from the very bottom to the very top with that epoxy resin, and they keep on doing that until they get very bored or it's lunchtime. <laughs> but that's what they did for 370,000 little honeycombs on the apex, the crew compartment, and the blunt end. Then they, they cure it. And uh, in these big ovens for a number of hours, it varies on the thickness. Then they take them out and they computer grind the epoxy to the right thickness in the right areas. So all of that is machined down to the proper thickness of the, uh, of the uh, heat shield. Now, when it's coming through the atmosphere, you don't just come barreling through at 25,000 miles an hour. This is the method that they use to have the Apollo um, command modules re-enter the atmosphere. You come in through the corridor, and you're pulling your maximum G's right about here, 6.4, and then you do this pull-up. And this is called a control period, where the command module is rotating that lift vector in the right directions to hit the splashdown point. This also allows you to bleed off kinetic energy in an upper layer of the atmosphere before you enter the denser parts of the atmosphere and you don't want to enter them at very high speeds. So you want to bleed off your kinetic energy then you enter your second control period again the command module is rotating that lift vector around taking the astronauts for a nice ride and then it comes down through this final area here and it splashes down, and the speed it hits the water is about 22 miles an hour, tow first. So that's what they do. They do this skipping. And you could do a skip in the atmosphere because you're never going to skip out of the atmosphere. You're going to stay in the atmosphere. And then you're going to bleed off and come back down again. So the first control period begins 400,000 feet lift up. Apollo guidance computer controlled, roll only. And, um, um, ow, can you see? Oh, it's uh, hands off, nominal. The first control period is 70 seconds, and it shrinks that landing footprint way down to 600 miles long, and it's got the maximum G. Then you begin that skip. The skip increases the range, and that's part of the parameters that they had to load, and then you reduce the heat and structural loads on the command module itself. Then you begin the second control period, and this begins at 0.2 Gs. 
one minute and 30 seconds. And now you start to really fine tune that entry trajectory to shrink that footprint down to the target splashdown point by rotating the vector. Finally, this phase ends when you deploy two drogue chutes. And that's at 23,500 feet. And you can see over here the apex has been jettisoned, exposing the Earth landing system, consisting of the two drogue chutes, three main parachutes, and the um, flotation uh, bags, which they used. So the main chutes open at 10,000 feet. And rather than have a belly flop in the Pacific Ocean, NASA had the the command module come in toe first, like this. So that even eased the shock of the splashdown. Um, and they came within two miles from this ship, the USS Hornet. Unfortunately, they came and landed in the water in a stable two position, like this, which is not good because your main hatch is underwater. Uh, not good. So they had to inflate the flotation bags, and that takes about 10, uh, 10 minutes. So the uh, command module slowly went from stable two to stable one, and there's your hatch right there above the level of the water. And then we get into the recovery and contamination control phase. <clears throat> the Hornet aircraft that were used, the air group, we had two E-1B tracers, and this is, um, uh, a modification of the tracer that you see in the hangar deck. That really beautifully um, renovated aircraft in the hangar deck is one of these, but it's got this big ray dome on top. There's a relay aircraft at 8,000 feet and the air boss at 6,000 feet controlling the airspace above the command module because you've got four other helicopters doing things above the command module, so the air boss is keeping track of all that and making sure everything goes properly as planned. You got two swims, swim one and swim two, and they have uh, uh, divers in those. Then you have recovery one, and you have the photo. I'll tell you more about each of those quickly. So the timeline, 8.37, um, the Hornet commences launching the aircraft. Splashdown, 955. The first UDT underwater demolition team divers in the water attach the sea anchor and the flotation collar and the raft. And then the contamination specialist drops down from the other helicopter. And at 11.05, the astronauts were on board the Hornet. Now, what's this stuff about underwater demolition team UDT? UDT divers were a specialized group of scuba divers developed in 1943 after the um, disastrous amphibious landing on Tinian. It was a small island uh, in the Pacific, but it was surrounded by coral reefs. And they uh, launched all the landing craft, and the landing craft were going in, then they would get stuck on the coral reefs. So they had no choice but to drop the ramp and have the Marines walk through you know, chest deep water to get to the shore, about four, sometimes 400 yards to get to the landing beaches because the landing craft could not get it over the reefs. So the landings on Tinian were especially bloody, unfortunately, but the Navy said, never are we going to experience anything like this again. So they put together the best divers they had, and these UDT divers would go into a landing um, a zone on an island and blow up the coral reefs and the obstructions that were in, in the water that were there to prevent the landing on the beaches. So every subsequent landing in the Pacific, the landing barges went right up to the beach, dropped their ramps, and the, and the Marines were ashore. But they learned a very, very difficult le lesson on the landings on Tinian uh, early on. The UDT teams morphed into SEALs in 1985. So now when you hear SEAL Team 6, SEAL Team 4, the genesis of these SEAL teams is the UDT divers, OK? So uh, we covered this one. They're on board the Hornet now at 11.05. And um, they had to wear um, protective gear. This is a reduced um, 
um, protocol for contamination control because of what we learned on Apollo 11. On Apollo 11, they had to wear biological isolation garments, which was really, really um, cumbersome and uncomfortable. But based on what we learned, these guys had it a little bit easier. You can see they're more comfort comfortably dressed here. And then they got into the mobile quarantine trailer. And um, uh, this was the first phase of their, uh, second phase of their quarantine. The first phase was getting back from the moon. So after, and there's also five guys rattling around inside there. There's a doctor, an engineer who knew how to work all the systems of the trailer, and three astronauts. This is a great picture. Here's the, the Hornet coming in to pick up the command module right here. And after she got the command module, she set sail for Pearl Harbor. 54 hours later, they got to Pearl. They offloaded the mobile quarantine trailer with the five people in it. They took this to the airfield. They flew it to Texas. And they moved it into the Lunar Receiving Laboratory, which uh, is specially made to accommodate lunar rocks and uh, possibly contaminated astronauts. So they had to spend the rest of their 21-day quarantine in the Lunar Receiving Laboratory. Total 21 days. You shorten that by the return to Earth, shorten that by steaming to Pearl, and you've got 15 and a half days left to be in the LRL. And uh, then everything went well. After the 15 days, they were given the go-ahead to go to be with your family. We'll see you in work on Monday. So everything went well for the Apollo 12 crew. Uh, so this is what we uh, talked about. Um, they did a lot of preparation. The Hornet did a lot of preparation for this 23 uh, open water uh, command module recoveries and 20 astronaut recovery. They had, you know, mock-up or fake uh, astronauts, crew members, obviously. But uh, the Apollo 12 recovery uh, and the quarantine control were perfectly executed by this ship. So we did it perfectly on 11, and again, we did it perfectly on 12. <clears throat> so just some final thoughts, you know, the Apollo program, we talked a lot about uh, the six missions, but that took the effort of 400,000 dedicated men and women across the aerospace industry uh, at that time. Um, uh, the pivotal decision was sending Apollo 8 into lunar orbit um, after they made modifications to the Saturn V booster. And like I said, Apollo 12 was considered the first operational mission, and that was followed by three of the J missions, um, which was 15, 16, 17, which included a powered rover that the astronauts actually drove around the moon and they clocked up some 56 uh, total miles on the lunar surface. Can you imagine driving on the lunar surface for some 56 miles total on those three missions? But they were just, you know, driving around, picking up rocks and the interesting thing is on the last mission, Apollo 17, one of the astronauts driving around the lunar surface was the geologist that had trained all the astronauts up to that mission. So they finally give, gave him his chance to go and play in his sandbox. And he was just elated, and um, that was the first geologist to actually be on the lunar surface in a rover. So we accomplished six successful lunar explorations. So we should be very uh, proud of what you know, this program has done. Um, uh, Apollo 11 astronauts visited many foreign countries after their mission. And in all of those places, the people were shouting, we did it. We did it. And a lot of times you think of the Apollo program as being a two-dimensional thing, engineering, and politics. But there's also one additional axis that people don't know about, and that's what the USIA did, US Information Agency did over the years from 61 to 69. They publicized everything that was going on, open book, 
to the rest of the world, sending models, sending films, uh, televising missions. Even if we had a risk of the thing failing, they were on TV in Uganda. And when these astronauts went around the world, the people knew that they were part and parcel of this process, and that's why they said, we did it. They were part of it. And that's thanks to the USIA. And one final, final, final thought. This doesn't need words. And with that, are there any questions? Yes? Uh, when, when the module landed, uh, how far was it from Hawaii and how far from where they planned to land? They planned to, they, they hit their splashdown target. I believe it was 560 miles uh, west, southwest of Hawaii, about 560 miles away. That was the splashdown point. Yeah. First of all, I want to thank you for the incredible, um, incredible uh, talk today. My pleasure. Uh, my question is, it sounds like we might have left a lot of equipment and detritus on the moon. Is this true? We left uh, six of the, um, of the uh, descent modules, um, six flags a number of things that they didn't want to uh, uh, spend the propellant to take back to the command module. Um, and we left a lot of experiments. But comparatively speaking, um, compared to the surface of the moon, it was a drop in the bucket. And we needed to have the descent module act as a launch pad for the ascent module. Well, so. Well, yeah, the cameras probably were there too, but um, yeah, we, we we did leave stuff there. There's no doubt. Yeah. How, how fast does that have to go to break through the atmosphere? So like I know it's 25,000 coming back down. No, uh, going up when they when they were go for TLI, that stage here had to get this stack going 25,000 miles an hour. And it started out just being in low Earth orbit, 120 miles, going 17,500 miles an hour. Okay. Circular orbit. And then this was lit again to get it from 17,500 to 25,000. What Mach is that? Oh, geez. In, 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 in the space, Mach doesn't matter. Okay. There's, no, <laughs> there's no air. Yeah. But when you get to 400,000 feet, you start getting free molecular atmosphere and that's when you can actually look in the, in the uh, speed of sound tables and you can find the speed of sound at 400,000 feet and you could figure it out that it's Mach 34. So, anything else? Anything else? Anything else? And keep in mind the next flight was Apollo 13 the proudest moment of NASA to bring those people back. Yeah. Um, that would be a matter of like 10 minutes or something like that, I think. It's, it's, it's not long. Okay. Not long. <clears throat> um, getting from the launch pad to orbit at 17.5 is 12 minutes. Stage one, stage two, stage three, 12 minutes. The second stage burn is six minutes. Okay. I would love to get one of the moon rollers. I think there's one on display, but I forget where it is. They do have one. And there's a book written about um, the development of the uh, rover. And I think it's uh, across the airless wilds about what they went through to design and develop the uh, lunar rover. It's an interesting book. Anybody else? Any more takers? Yes? Is this presentation on the web, on the Harmonix website? We will put it on, uh, we have a, a YouTube page, and it'll just take me a couple of days to clean it up. 
just as a little bit of PR, the, the ship did put together a series of six videos um, I worked with the ship on, and it's the history of the space race. So it takes you all the way from JFK's speech all the way up to Apollo 11. And in fact, the sixth one talks about Soviet um, um, space vehicles. We had Mercury, Gemini, Apollo. They had Vostok, Voskhog, and Soyuz. And some of the things that's in that last video is, is pretty amazing. And if you ever want to get entertained, if you're having difficulty falling asleep, pull up that last video and Salmonexville. It's really, really interesting. And they also had a version of this called the N1. It had 30 engines in the first stage, 30 engines in the first stage. They tried to launch it four times, and each time it failed. And that's when they said, we're not going to be in this game anymore. The last flight, I think, was in 74. And the Chinese are trying to go to the moon, right? Everybody is. Yeah. It's the uh, pl place du jour. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, look at those videos. And it's um, the stepping stones to the moon. Talks about Gemini, talks about Mercury, talks about JFK's speech. Um, and there's also some very interesting things in there that went into his speech. Very interesting things. Do you want to know what they are? Before he made that speech, LBJ was head of the Space Council or something like that. So JFK said, Lyndon, get answers for me on these questions. Lyndon took that thing and said, Werner, give me some answers. So he gave it to Werner von Braun. And if you read, it's nine pages long was the response. And if you uh, read it, um, Warner says the best thing you could do is have a very defined milestone. For example, we will land people on the moon by the end of 1968. And he also said that we can do this because it's going to take a booster ten times the size of anything we have today to get to the moon. We don't have that booster. The Russians don't have that booster. But I feel we can do it. And with that assurance and using the same logic that Werner said, JFK said, by the end of this decade, we're going to land people on the moon and bring them back safely to the Earth. In fact, I got the letter here, if you want to look at it. But it's nine pages long. But it's, it's, it's almost a, a direct pull out of Warner Von Braun's letter back to Lyndon Johnson. And, and that speech before Congress, where he said by the end of 69, that took place two weeks after Alan Shepard went up in this little spacecraft for 15 minutes and 22 seconds. And he didn't even go into orbit. He went into a suborbital ballistic trajectory. And two weeks after this flight, LB, uh, Kennedy had the guts to commit the country to landing a man on the moon by the end of 69. I mean, blows my mind. If you want to see the letter, I got it here. But uh, a lot of amazing things went into this success. It's just an incredible story. OK. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure.